I'm actually sitting in with John Thompson, who usually does them uh, with great savoir faire, but um, he's actually off in Africa, just about to go to Africa to do a film, so I'm standing in. Um, I just want to, as a bit of an introduction, actually, I just wanted to read from the, um, the back jacket of um, this autobiography, which um, I've, I've found out since it's very rare now, as uh, Walter's bought up all the copies. So if you find that, if you find that in a bookshop, buy one, it's going to be a rare item. Um, but it says that Walter, <laughs> Walter Leslie was born in Berlin in 1926. He came to England as a refugee from Hitler two months before the outbreak of the Second World War and settled in Richmond upon Thames. He interrupted his evening classes for a BSc when offered a much sought after job as a clapper boy at the Riverside Studios in 1946. His progress towards becoming a director of photography took an unconventional route via documentaries into features and he filmed his first feature in 1954, Another Sky, directed by the then, the, the then editor of Sight and Sound, Gavin Lambert. Walter Lasserley has by now photographed over 50 feature films as well as an even larger number of documentaries and shorts and continues to work, uh, to continue to work on both all over the world. And um, some of the films you might be more familiar with um, uh, are A Taste of Honey, um, that was 1961, Electra 1961, Tom Jones 1962, and Zorba the Greek 1964. Um, it's also worked on um, with um, such um, eminent directors as Lindsay Anderson and Tony Richardson, and also had um, um, a creative association with um, James Ivory and Ismail Merchant on a string of successes, including um, The Wild Party, Heat and Dust, and The Bostonians. I just wanted to read um, the first kind of line from the, uh, this autobiography, because I think it says it all, really. It says, From my last year at school, age 15, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to be a cameraman, shooting feature films. My mind was quite made up. Ladies and gentlemen, errant, <laughs> inerrant cameraman, Walter Lasserley. I too. I'm too. <laughs> Thank you. And I might also tell you that I had to write that blurb. I always thought they did that for you, but I had to write that my own blurb for the. <laughs> right. So I think um, perhaps we, could, we should start with, with a clip of film, which um, is one of the first, I think probably, um, it's almost like a fly on the wall documentary, I mean, for its time, because in a sense that you were um, observing people, though you did say that you had to, you, you set some of these the situations up. Yes. But... Um, um, the first clip, which is a black and white clip, is um, Every Day Except Christmas, which is about um, the flower market um, in Covent Garden. Well, it's, it's about yeah. the, the whole market at Covent Garden. The whole Garden, market. Yeah. We kind of well, I should probably say a, a, a few things about this. Mm. We, we chose these extracts uh, together tonight for... Um, there's a sort of thread that runs through the selection, which is that it leads from documentary into features and it, it points out how useful a training in documentary can be uh, for certain types of, uh, of work in feature films and in, in, all the, in nearly all the extracts that you will see you will find that, that thread running through it and the um, Everything Except Christmas was part of the uh, movement, I don't really want to call it a movement called free cinema, it was, it was the free cinema period Free cinema was never really a movement. It was a, a title that Lindsay Anderson coined uh, for to, to give a sort of name to, to unify a program of films at the National Film Theatre in 1954, something like that, um, which were three very different films. Oh, Dreamland, a film that he did himself uh, in, in a very amateur way, in, in, in the sense that it was, you know, it was totally made outside totally. Uh, totally outside any professional kind of framework. Uh, Mama Don't Allow and a film called Together, which is a very remarkable film, well worth seeing if you ever get your hands on it. It's still being distributed by a BFI, I think. And in order to unify this into a program, give it some kind of a label, Lindsay inv event invented this label, Free Cinema. And the, and the uh, program was such a, such a success that uh, over the next uh, four years, uh, four or five more programs. There were six altogether, six free cinema programs altogether, each time at the National Film Theatre. And um, every day except Christmas was part of the 
middle one, of the third one or the fourth one. So it was part of those three cinema programs. And um, it was uh, Lindsay's attitude to documentary, and not, not only Lindsay's, but uh, also the other three cinema people, his attitude to documentary was that uh, British documentaries of that period, <coughs> up to that point, and beyond indeed, um, used to have a very um, kind of cold clinical uh, approach to to um, to their subjects. It it didn't go. It didn't show the people very very well. If it was a film about some about a steelworks or or something, the people were almost incidental. They were shown as operatives, but they were never never st shown as Tom, Dick, or Harry. You get some feeling for the individuality of those people. So you, you, you almost felt that if you showed a piece of steel being forged or something, uh, the close-up of the man looking at it through the goggles, he was only there as a cutaway because you couldn't join those other two shots together without... So you never, you never really got to know that person. So there was never any, any emphasis on the people. And there was that kind of documentary, and there was also the kind of documentary... I mean, there weren't a lot of documentaries, although there were a lot of shorts shown in cinemas. It was in the days when the, we had both the double feature program, you had a, a, an A feature and a B feature, and you sometimes also had a short film. And the short films, um, on the whole, uh, could be called documentaries, but they, weren't, they were really pretty laughable <coughs> as, as documentaries. They were the sort of travelogue where you say, and, uh, and as the sun pulls away from the shore and our ship sinks slowly in the west, that kind of, um, uh, of documentary. So Every Day Except Christmas was an attempt to make a quite a different sort of documentary, much more, much more people-oriented, and also in its, and in its, <coughs> in its making, um, there was a sort of plan and there was a sort of script, but it was it was very rudimentary. It was it included quite a bit of improv improvisation in one stage or another, and it made great use of um, the uh, newly discovered, the newly uh, um, produced film stock uh, by Ilford. Ilford had just produced in I think it was nineteen fifty. <coughs> 53, uh, they produced the first uh, black and white film stock that had a sensitivity of 400 ASA, uh, which made, which was four times as much as, as uh, anything then current. I mean, Plus X, uh, which was the stock that all feature films and most other films were photographed on in those days, was um, only 64 ASA to, to tungsten light. And here was a stock with 400 ASA, which you know was eight times as sensitive, virtually. So it enabled certain available light-type photography to be done. And uh, this Covent Garden film, uh, Every Day Except Christmas, could not have been made uh, without that film stock, because the lighting, uh, to light Covent Garden for a slower film stock would be enormously expensive, uh, virtually impossible. Um, so it enabled us to shoot in those market halls with the existing lighting um, in the old Covent Garden market and just using a hand, a battery lamp in the hand or a, a, a little, what we call a hand basher, just a little flood lamp hand held on a small tripod um, with either battery operated or it might have been on, on, the, on the mains but uh, just to give a little bit of extra light to the close-ups but virtually uh, made with available light and uh, that char characterizes the film and then uh, going on from that, uh, I'll just jump ahead a little bit before I show you that clip to say that that film stock also played a great part in the shooting of Taste of Honey, which, uh, where we did something which had never been done before uh, and hasn't very often been done since, I don't think, for that matter, in, in films. And that is that we, we keyed the, the film stock to the location. So that film was shot on three different film stocks, Taste of Honey, was shot on a, on a low sensitivity film stock, equivalent, all shot on Ilford stock by the way, because Kodak didn't have anything comparable at the time. Um, it was shot on uh, Ilford FP3 as it won, was then, which is now FP4. Uh, for the exteriors, it was shot on HP4, which is now HP5, for the uh, later interiors, and on HPS, which was the 
400 ASA film stock, which doesn't exist anymore, but because now the, the, mid, the middle one has been improved to that sort of speed, or has been made more flexible. Um, and, the, and the HPS film stock had a certain characteristic that you could light it flat, you could light it fairly flatly, and still get, it had a sort of inherent contrast. The, the granularity and the structure of the image was quite different to the other film stocks. The other film stocks, if you lit them very flatly, you got a very muddy result. And as you probably know, in black and white, contrast is everything. In color, you can have a very soft, a very contrastless image. And the color differentiation will give you a, a, a watchable image. But in black and white, uh, if you fall below a certain minimum of contrast, the image goes muddy, and uh, you, you just lose it. You don't have an image anymore. So that HPS film stock, that 404 ASA film stock, had this advantage that it could, um, you could light very softly and still get a, a, a very good contrast. And it also had a, a marked granularity, which you will see, but acceptable because it created a, a kind of atmosphere all its own. And it was certainly acceptable in a documentary context, but I then used it in a feature film to to go with the architecture, with the art direction of the, uh, with the, uh, the first group of, uh, the first flat that the characters live in, the main characters, Rita Tashim character and her mother, Dora Bryan, lives in, um, which was supposed to be very shabby, very slummy. Um, the film stock added its element to the art direction in giving that place a certain look. But every time you go outside, you're on another film stock. When you go back, you're on the other one again. And that's something that has, wasn't, you know, done before. And again, uh, when I was preparing that film, uh, the labs and a lot of other people, you know, strongly said, oh, you mustn't do that. That's, you know, that's out sort of thing. Because it's never been done and they didn't think it would work. But it did work. And I then repeated the technique again in Zorba the Greek slightly differently. Uh, because there I used the, the very, very slow insensitive film stock, uh, which had a very, very fine granularity, very fine grain, um, uh, was used for the exteriors of, of Zorba the Greek, um, and the other two film stocks for various types of interiors and, and rainy weather exteriors. So I again did the same, I used the same trick, if you like, twice, and it, it worked, in my opinion, very well both times. So you'll be able to see some, some of that. Um, no, we're, uh, sorry, but you, if you ever see the whole of Taste of Honey, you'll be able to see that. But the bit we're showing you today is a, is a different bit. But anyway, I just thought I'd mention that because the, <coughs> the influence of the documentary techniques and my experience in shooting uh, documentaries of various sorts uh, came in very, very handy. And Taste of Honey certainly wouldn't look the way it does. Neither would Zorba the Greek or quite a number of other or, or films that I shot later. Would, would have certain sequences in those films would not have been like that had they been shot by somebody else or had they been shot uh, by me without that uh, documentary experience. So we're going to look at, at uh, a little bit of the, of the latter part of Every Day Except Christmas, which is a nice, it's a film, by the way, which um, the final version of that film was largely created in the cutting room. It was, it was shot fairly economically in a period of four weeks. Um, and it was initially supposed to be a 20-minute film, but it grew. I mean, we knew right away during the shooting that it probably wouldn't be. It would be longer. And Ford Motors, who paid for it, and uh, the producer, Liam Claw, no longer with us, unfortunately, was very indulgent and allowed Lindsay spend six months in the cutting room uh, finishing this film. And the, the, the sequence you're going to see, which is towards the end of the film, is a very nice example of building up uh, a sequence in the cutting room, in the editing, uh, and a very, very nice use of, of the score as well, because it, it, is, it is almost cut to music, uh, like a fugue. Um, and it's, it's, got a couple of, it's got a couple of handheld uh, tracking shots in it and stuff like that. But the rhythm of it is, is, is I think, which is what, what is nice. It's, uh, it's a very nice climax. It's virtually the climax of the film, and I think it works. It works very well there. Okay. I'll press the. Press the magic button. <laughs> the old button. Yeah. Right. This is all on video, by the way. I'm afraid. <laughs> um. So if anybody. Wants
anyone else to ask any questions along the way? We're going to sort of go yes, chronologically, do. but if you want to just do do um, that. stick your hand up if you want to mention anything. Can you put there's somebody's uh, hand up over yeah. there? Oh, right. Did you, presumably you operated on that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Terrific, if I may say so. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, could you ask them to put the, put the lights in the auditorium on? Could he hear us? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's better. Um, yeah, some of the other people you see there are the characters that we've established, the two young boys uh, are two. The, the film establishes, uh, centres centers around, I think, six main characters within the market, and two of those are in that sequence at, at the end as well. Um, <coughs> and the other thing, of course, that, that one tends to forget nowadays is that... Um, documentary took uh, an absolutely sort of quantum leap forward um, at the point at which the first hand-holdable portable 16 millimeter sync sound camera was invented which was the Eclair MPR which first came onto the market I think in 1964 63 or 64 before that time you always had this tremendous dilemma that if you wanted to have, if you wanted to shoot a, uh, a reasonably natural documentary scene, um, but that it took play and, and you wanted the sound, whether it's dialogue or any, any, any synchronous sound, you had this dilemma that if you wanted the synchronous sound, you had to have a camera set up on a tripod or on a dolly, because any camera that you could blimp so that you wouldn't hear the sound of the camera, uh, was so heavy that it could not possibly be handheld. Now we we got round that a little bit on on a film called The Lambeth Boys, which we made shortly after, by making a a, 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 a handmade blimp out of out of pieces of sleeping bag and putting it round the Arriflex, and that enabled us to get certain interview scenes of the giggly girls in the courtyard of the school of the club in The Lambeth Boys. But by and large, you could not shoot sync sound. Uh, in a documentary situation where where the situation was fluid, because you had the you either had to shoot it without sound, in which case it could be reasonably fluid and improvised, or you had to get the people nail them down virtually and put the camera up and lights if required. And by the time you've done all that, of course, any spontaneity, any any naturalness had disappeared. Now this is a very important uh, point. The point at which you no longer had that dilemma is a very, to my mind, an extremely important turning point in the whole history of documentary. And um, it's sort of very emphasized if you ever see uh, what was considered a, a sort of excellent documentary pre-war that contained uh, some of those elements, like a film that comes to mind as housing problems made by, I think, Arthur Elton in, in the late 30s and shot in the slums of Stepney. And there you have some, some interviews, you have some people, the real people talking to the camera. And if you see that today, you say that's a documentary, I mean it's laughable because it's totally theatrical, it has no naturalness about it. But at that time, of course, it was accepted as very documentary because the lighting was rough and the people were obviously the real people. But you couldn't do anything else then if you wanted people talking and you wanted to shoot them sing sound, you had to have that kind of setup. So in Every Day Except Christmas, uh, we got around that problem, because Every Day Except Christmas was made okay. in 56, 56, yeah. Uh, so this is eight years before this turning point. And we got around that problem in, in three different ways. We, in, there are two cafe sequences in that film. Um, one, at night, in the middle of the night, sort of in the small hours of the morning, like three o'clock in the morning. And the other one is uh, 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 after dawn, sort of six o'clock in the morning, when people come in to have their breakfast, the porters and so on. And in the first cafe, uh, we shot entirely with a handheld camera, and the, the impression, there isn't much, there isn't anybody talking to camera, but people are talking amongst themselves, and there's no sort of complete conversation, but you get the feeling of a synchronous sound sequence. You get a feeling of a, of a sequence with, syn with dialogue, which is in fact all done in the cutting room. Because either you're looking at the person who's listening to somebody else, so you don't actually see the voice, the person who's talking, or it's off screen in some other way. So it's, it's laid on, and it's very skillfully built up in the cutting room. 
So you get an impression of a sing sound sequence which is not a sing sound sequence. In the in the main body of the hall, we once did a, a short. It was almost experimentally because we knew what the problems were, but we got to know two or three of the porters very well. So <clears throat> when they're having their tea break, we set up a, a blimp camera. But well, I think it was actually it was improvised because we didn't actually have a blimp camera on the job. But we set up a camera and we we muffled it, and uh, we set it up on on long focus lens so we could be somewhere away. And, uh, and was shot with sound synchronously, and we even had to, to doctor it in the, in, the, um, in the cutting room because there was a certain amount of effing and blinding going on, which was then unacceptable uh, in cinema or television. So wherever they said the, wo- the dreaded word, the, a heavy crate dropping was, the sound of a heavy crate dropping was overlaid in order to mask that. So, 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 so. What are you <coughs> banging, uh, talking about, eh? <laughs> well, uh, you should boom bang it. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> anyway, so that was one way around it, so, but for a very short sequence. And then the last way, the third way, uh, which one can still do today if one feels like it, was uh, a hidden camera. So that we, in the second cafe, we were behind a sort of screen, and we just there was a, a curtain drawn, and the camera was behind the curtain. And it was behind the counter, so we could we sh- we saw people coming up to the counter and ordering food, you know. And, and there's a, a very large uh, gypsy lady that comes in and and, uh, and orders a cup of tea, and then she says, "And no sugar," like that. <laughs> and uh, because they were engrossed in what they were doing, they didn't notice that there was a camera there. And, and uh, again, it was blim, so they couldn't hear it running. So those were the three alternatives, but it's very, very awkward, and you always had to find a way around this. Once that other camera had been invented, uh, of course, it all became uh, very easy. But with hindsight, uh, I now look back with some fondness at, at, at those days, pre, uh, pre-blimped uh, uh, scene cameras, because uh, nowadays it's so easy to record sync sound with a handheld camera, either a video camera or a film camera, that uh, people often neglect, the consequence, one of the unfortunate consequences is that people often neglect the image altogether. And if you look at, at a lot of, of present day documentaries, or what goes under the name of documentaries, a lot of them are illustrated radio <coughs> times. You could, have, you could have the radio times and you could have a picture of the four people interviewed and then the, all the rest is on the soundtrack. You don't need to see them. I mean, it's not important that you see them, their expression while they're saying these things. is often of no particular interest. The whole weight of the story is carried on the soundtrack. And this is very obvious in a program that the BBC made some years ago about the, the, the film called <coughs> We Are the Lambeth Boys, where, where they made a program, a, 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 a three-program series. The first program, they just showed the old film second program, uh, they showed, they researched and they found the people who took play, uh, part in that film and they found out what happened to them 25, they showed them 25 years later. And the third program, they showed what happened to that club, uh, what that club is like in Brixton or in Lambeth, where it was in Lambeth, of course, um, 25 years later. Uh, and all that is of some, you know, so sociological and human interest. But to, to me, the interesting thing is that in the, in the original film, the story is told visually. Whereas the other two films are talking heads. The other two films, virtually all of it is talking heads. It's just people talking to camera or amongst themselves with the camera looking on. But the, the subtlety of, of a sequence like when they, when they go from their club in, in Lambeth to the, to the posh school in Mill Hill, Mill Hill School, and they, they have a friendly cricket match. The whole irony, the whole sort of contrast, the sociological context of the whole thing it's, it's all in the images. There's, there's not a word spoken. Not a word. And the commentary is very sparse. It's, it's all there in the pictures. And that just doesn't happen. These days, it's so often, if you look at things, you say, well, you close your eyes, and what, what are you missing? Not a lot. Right. So we move on to <laughs> Taste of Honey. Yeah? Any, yeah. Any, uh, anybody else want to ask any questions about it? We have plenty of chance at the end as well. All right, we'll move on to yeah, Taste, of honey, to taste yeah? of honey, and then we'll talk about this. Which is, afterwards. again, the Blackpool sequence, which is all shot in one day, by the way, and you're only seeing half of it now.
the, the, that whole thing with the with the nude and the uh, the sideshow, we just found it there. But the whole Blackpool sequence, which is this bit plus a long sequence dialogue sequence on the pier, which because it was dialogue, we had to shoot set it up and we with tracks and and uh, uh, that's all shot in one day. And um, that uh, sideshow there, we just found it there. And he just quickly, he, Tony said, oh, that's marvellous, <laughs> like he does. And um, like he did. And um, he just, you know, arranged something with, with the people and said, give them something. It wasn't, there wasn't any contracts or forms to sign, the, you know, what do they call those forms? Release, the forms. release forms or what they that. <laughs> he just agreed something with them. And we we just shot it there and then, as it as it was. And the voice is 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 somebody else's that's dubbed on afterwards. It wasn't her voice. Um, you, so it's all, all, all one of the first improvised. Films actually, all on location. Yes, in that's studio. well. The yeah, the other thing is T Taste of Honey was in fact the first film, 1961, was the first film made for a major British distributor. The third, first sort of A feature, you could call it. Uh, which was shot entirely on location in interiors and exteriors, uh, and only one. Uh, Taste of Honey was actually ready for production one year before it was actually done, and the reason that it didn't go ahead was Tony wanted particularly to shoot it all on location, and the financiers, the distributors, wouldn't let him, because they said, "Well, it's all very well you saying you you don't want sunshine, you're going to film anyway, but you'll get up there and you'll say, well, we, we had to." But they were afraid of delays, waiting waiting for the sun. And however many times he told them that for that sort of subject he didn't want sunshine, they just didn't believe him. So he, he couldn't go ahead. It could only go ahead by being uh, what's called cross-collateralized, which means that the Saturday night and Sunday morning, which was made a year earlier, or two years earlier, uh, was such a tremendous success. It's one of the few films, I think, ever made in England which ran on both of the main circuits, one after the other. It ran on the Odeon circuit, and then it ran on the on the ABC circuit, as it was called then, or the other way around. And it was such a big success that they they mortgaged the profits, as it were, of that film against any eventual losses on, on Taste of Honey. But Taste of Honey was also a big success, but distributors just wouldn't allow it to be made a year earlier. So so that was another, another first of that film. And the second uh, sequence you're going to see is, is there's a, it's, it illustrates two things. First of all, there's a scene in there which I call lighting with sand, because you'll see a, you'll see a silhouette scene in a, in a railway arch. And at one point in a long, in long shot, the characters are silhouetted against the background. And the top part of the shot was okay because they're silhouetted against the sky. But at the bottom of the shot, there is actually uh, a, an earthen, bank, there's a slope, so the, their legs are not silhouetted, and if I hadn't done what I did, uh, it would have been, the silhouette would have been like cut off at the knees, because the silhouette obviously only works when you silhouette it against something, lighter. So as the, the bank was rather dark, I had a lot of sand, light sand sprinkled on the earth at the point where their legs would be, so they could be silhouetted against something light. So that's what I call lighting that shot. That shot is lit with sand, not with lamps. <laughs> and the other thing is that it's an, an example of how one can make use of a weather change and build it into the story it's, instead of saying, oh my God, we'll have to stop, the sun's come out or the sun's gone in, as one so often did. And in black and white, of course, it was a real problem. In color, it's much easier to disguise uh, changes in weather because a shot photograph with sunshine and a shot photograph without sunshine in color needn't be all that different. They can be, they can be matched. But in black and white, it's disaster. So here, we were shooting this sequence, and I could see that uh, you know, it was clearing. You, you could tell you always expect it to be a bit of a weather prophet in this gym, my job. I always tell students that my job is one-third photography, one-third psychology, and one-third meteorology. People are always saying, when's the sun going to come out? You're supposed to know. <laughs> and um, so I could see it was, the weather was breaking up. So we did certain shots. We did the shots we knew had to do in certain order. So that when they go through the arch, um, the mood changes at that point. Because at the beginning, she's very, she's, she's very depressed. She's 
discovered she's pregnant, she doesn't know what to do about it, and so on. And he kind of turns her mood around, and at the end of the scene, they're dancing away, saying, let's go to the country. And at that moment, the weather appears to change as well, you see. Because the scene starts in, in, in a very cloudy, depressed sort of scene, and it ends in, in an up, uh, which is also sunny. And that's being able to, to, to see it coming and to improvise and to, to build that into the, you know, to make use of it rather than have it uh, see it as a hindrance. The video projection is remarkably good. I mean, if you sit at the back of the hall, you hardly realize that it is video. Well, I was very surprised. Oh, yeah. Go on. Keep going. <laughs> I was very surprised when you said it was on video. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to know, you said that um, those scenes on the, the front, uh, were they all the people around about? Were they just there or were they film extras? If they weren't film extras, if you were filming through ordinary people, what sort of problems did you meet? Well, the problem with that, as you all know, is um, people looking in the camera. Mm. And uh, very often you're told you can't do that simply because people will look in the camera. And, uh, in, in, certain, in, in, in third world countries, this can be a real problem because if you appear anywhere like I have done in the marketplace in Marrakesh, for instance, uh, having a white skin is enough. You don't. You don't even have to have a camera with you. You immediately gather a crowd. So, uh, but even there, I used certain documentary techniques to to good effect, in order to get around that problem. Now, in Blackpool, uh, all we did there is we had a very small group of extras with us, of uh, um, professional extras, who um, that's what called extras. They're called artists. Anyway. Um, about six or seven, and they are the people who are immediately behind the principals when they're walking. And otherwise, I'm just walking backwards in front of them, so the people immediately behind are extras who are not looking at the camera. But if you look carefully, you'll see that other people are going by in the opposite direction, and they sort of turn around. But you've got to be prepared to snip, I mean, it's going to happen, so you have to be able to snip bits out as long as you get enough usable material. You obviously have to shoot a little bit more, you mustn't keep it too, too fine. But if you, if you just shoot a certain amount of material, you know that you'll be able to snip out bits where people look in the camera and you still have a very usable sequence. And there's, there's a big, uh, there's a big um, um, lesson in, in all that because it's taken to considerable length these days. Uh, the people say, well, you can't do it that way. And I've been in situations where, in, in America, for instance, where uh, we had a shot to do on one film, for instance, of Susan Sarandon getting out of a cab, crossing the street, and going into a, a, a skyscraper on Sixth Avenue. And it was, uh, I can't remember if it was a weekday or Sunday, it doesn't really matter that much. Anyway, we had the usual block-long pantechnicans of, of gear with us, and they were proposing to spend a half a day to get that shot. They were going to rope off a whole area and, and post the cops. And I said, this is ridiculous, you know. It's, it's just a sort of a walking into a building. Oh, yeah, but it's Susan Sarandon. People will look at that, blah, blah, blah. I said, OK, just give me half an hour. And you all, you all, the, the, the important thing is that you all stay out of the way. I don't want anybody at all. The continuity can, girl can lurk somewhere. We don't even need the director. Just leave it to me, and I'll get you that shot. So we made us a, a very simple signal, like putting up a, a handkerchief or something. We, we put Susan Sar Sarandon's cab about 100 yards away down the, down the road. I, I was there with the hand camera, which doesn't attract any attention at all in New York, w walking about on this sort of plaza in front of this skyscraper. And uh, at a suitable moment, we just put the hand up. And I still had the camera down here. And when the cab got within sight, I just put the camera up, and the cab drew up, and she got out, and panned into the building, and the story, in half an hour. But if they'd done it the way they think it needs to be done on a professional feature film, they sort of say, oh, you know, this is not a documentary, you know, they say rather crossly, you know, the, the production manager and, and people like that. But it's horses for courses. Of course, if you, if you have a dialogue scene to play, and you've got, you've got Michael Caine and Susan Sarandon, you can't do that, obviously. But if it's just a simple shot like that. But there's a whole philosophy, <coughs> or two different philosophies involved here, which 
uh, I'll go into again in, in relation to, to heat and dust later on, because there, uh, heat and dust to me always is a much better picture of India, a, a much more natural picture of India than Gandhi or um, what's the Forster film, The Passage to India, because it's made with a, a different philosophy behind it. That the, the philosophy of, of Gandhi and Passage to India, good pictures though they are, is that you they're what I call pine wood pictures made on location. So you take uh, 50 or 500 people from pine wood and you bring them to India to, uh, along with their caterers and the beef, beef steak and roast veg and to, you know, what have you. And if you want to do a, a, a big scene, you, 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 you rope off an area, whether it's uh, uh, 10 square yards or 100 square yards or 2 square kilometers, you rope that off you remove all the natural inhabitants, you put in your own people, and you bring your crane and your, your tracks and your thing, you can work perfectly peaceful, you won't be interrupted, and you can do your job, but you will not, what you will get is a shot like you were on the lot at Pinewood. You will not get the same, the sort of shot that you will see later on in, in um, no, we haven't got that bit. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there is a shot in Eaton Dust where Julie Christie walks down a street of bazaars, and, okay, Occasionally, somebody looks towards the camera, but it, it, there are tricks of working around that, so it, it's okay. But it's a completely different feel. And the, in Heat and Dust, there's only most of it is interior. There are only very few exteriors, so the the feel is all created with very very little. But it's, a, it's two completely opposing philosophies as to whether you you create a theatrical space somewhere and you fill that space with your people. You you stage everything, or whether you develop a technique to insinuate your actors into the natural situation. Sorry, somebody over there wanted to ask a question first. Yes, gentleman with glasses. Yeah, I was just asking about the black ball, the black ball there. Yeah. The, the, yeah, at the handheld, and we walked backwards. Yes. Was that how many tapes did you, was that just one tape? Well, we probably did it again. I mean, we did a certain bit, and I, uh, I would sort of think <laughs> back, was there anything terribly wrong with that? And, then I'd say, okay, let's do one more, and we'd just continue from where we'd stopped and do another little bit. Uh -huh. So it's, it's not really, it's not ever going back and doing exactly the same thing again. It's just c continuing using the next bit of the promenade, you know. I was going to ask you a question later, but I'll put it now because it might be of interest if you're going to see something later. In general terms, how did you like the interiors of Eaton Dust? Well, in general terms, um, my uh, technique for colour films, in very, ge in very general terms, is that I light the, the day interiors with reflected HMI light, with uh, a little bit of direct light mixed in, perhaps. Uh, particularly in heat and dust, where we wanted to give the atmosphere of shuttered rooms, because the windows in heat and dust are, uh, in India are never, are never open, because you don't want to let the heat in. So you usually, I mean, the normal situation in India is that you open up onto a sort of terrace area, so you're not getting direct sunlight anyway. But the sort of shuttered feeling, I think, is very Indian. It's very important. So in most of those interiors, I use, the day interiors, I used uh, to bounce a, a 4K HMI off the ceiling, if the ceiling happened to be near enough and white. And I used umbrellas, and I bounced smaller units into umbrellas, but very, very few. And that is my general technique for day interiors. <coughs> the night interiors and the night exteriors I handle quite differently, um, with usually with tungsten light and usually with small units creating pools of light interrupted by uh, areas of shadow. Mainly direct. So. Direct, yes. Quite different. The day and the night techniques are really quite different. Sometimes there's a bit of overlap, but on the whole, without going into great detail, that would describe it. Okay, any other questions? No, well, I think Taste of Honey sort of represented a sort of very sort of gritty, almost kitchen sink northern, uh, and it represented like working class hate people. That, hate that word. <laughs> yeah, that's what people kind of, you know, that all that kind of, um, the, the loneliness and the long distance trying to all kind of get lumped in yeah, quite right, with yeah. that um, yeah. kind of... Um, ethos, but the next film, a year later, you did Tom Jones, which couldn't have been more different, because right. uh, it's very lush, it's, it was in colour, it's, you know, right. a period drama, and um, um, certainly the, the bit we've chosen is, is the, um, 
the, the meat, um, the hunt meat, and then the hunt. I don't know if you want to talk us through a bit on yes. that, and then we'll, we'll show it. Yeah, well, the thing, there's certain things about Tom Jones I want to say. that First of all, I didn't want to do the film. I was afraid of it. Because having just done Taste of Honey and Lonely Little Don't Listen, Long Distance Runner, which are very intimate films, very personal, I saw Tom Jones as a great, great big epic. And I sort of said, well, it's not my, my cup of tea. But I was, I was afraid of it. I was absolutely afraid of it. And also, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't going to do it. I wasn't the first cameraman uh, to be approached. Uh, Taste of Honey, um, Tom Jones, was shot in the summer of 1962, and in the spring of 1962, in February and March of 1962, we were shooting Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner. So Tom Jones was already in preparation while we were shooting that film. And Tony Richardson had already engaged Ozzy Morris to shoot Tom Jones. And during the preparation period, both during the making of loneliness and the period in between, which was quite short, it became more and more apparent to both Tony and Ozzy that they were moving apart. Because Ozzy, Tony said, why can't we make Tom Jones like Taste of Honey or Loneliness? And Ozzy was of the opinion then that, um, and he advised Tony accordingly, that you couldn't make Tom Jones like that because Tom Jones is a big epic and, and in colour and all that and you couldn't sort of make it in the same way as, as you made uh, Tate's Funny because it just wouldn't work and Tony sort of thought well why, why not? So they, they kind of drifted apart on that and eventually uh, uh, Ozzy wanted to draw him back into a, a much more studio orientated uh, big picture syndrome movie and Tony didn't want to go that way so they parted company quite amicably and uh, I was persuaded, uh, first rather against my will, to, to, to take it over. And um, there was, there's one other anecdote which is, is always sticks in my mind because it's, it comes up so often in my mind, that um, while Ozzy was in charge, they were making tests at Technicolor about desaturization. Uh, de they wanted the image to be desaturated. And uh, this is something which had already been done on Moby Dick by John Houston. Um, was, was, uh, Ozzy was the cameraman on that, I think, possibly. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, so they were making tests for this desaturation process. And they used to go to Technicolor every now and then to see the latest results of these tests. And the art director on Tom Jones and also on some of the other films was Rafe Brinton, whom he used to call the Admiral, because he was in the Navy in the war. And uh, so they went off to Technicolor, and I was re it was reported to me, uh, this was sort of during the time we were making lo uh, Loneliness, it was reported to me that they'd had yet another unsuccessful screening at Technicolor of these tests. And uh, they, all, they came storming out of there, sort of saying, no, that's not, 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 not right at all. And Rafe Brinton made this very, very astute remark, which I've often thought about since, and he said, the trouble with them is they're not artists, they're chemists. <laughs> and that is a, a very good pointer to the limits of trickery, gimmickry, technical gimmickry in order to create a certain effect. And it's my... Um, when I was preparing Tom Jones, I also wanted to desaturate the image. Um, but I didn't want to go that way. So I, I was looking for... Um, another way and I came across some bits of net which turned out to have come originally from George Perrinal and they were given to me by my operator Des Davis who later became director and still is and um, we had these two little bits of net which are part of a woman's hat veil of the 1920s a silk material very very fine indeed quite irreproducible as I discovered later and uh, we made tests and that net seemed to me entirely satisfactory because it, it, it performed two vital functions and it performed them at the same time. So by putting one filter net, call it what you like, one object in front of the lens, you could achieve two effects at the same time. One was to pastelize the color, which is this desaturation effect, and the other is to diffuse the image because one thing I've always hated is very sharp color. And as lenses get sharper and sharper and sharper, it's all the more important um, to soften the image because sharp lenses are fine for photographing machinery, but they're not good for photographing the human face. 
as people, as photographers, have known this for years, for decades, because before the war there used to be things called portrait lenses, which were made specifically not to be sharp. Because a sharp lens isn't what you want in photographing a face, because you don't want to see every pore and every hair root. Uh, so the sharper the manufacturers make the lenses, the more filters we stick in front to destroy that sharpness again. Long story. Anyway, this net turned out to be a perfect image, and when you see Tom Jones, um, I want you to watch out in the hunt sequence. Uh, we only had these two pieces of net, and, and one was that big and the other one was smaller. So we used one on the larger, longer focal lenses and one on the, high, on the wide angle lenses. But then we had a second unit, so there were days when the second unit had one of the nets and I had the other one. And that was okay when we were with it with, together, but there were later on there was a period when the second unit was shooting inserts such as the huntsman blowing his horn and the spur going into the side of the horse's flank. And on those days he didn't have the net. And you can still see today, even on video, when those shots come up, they there's an immediate increase in saturation and an increase in contrast that bothers me to this day. You, you watch for that, you'll see it. Um, because of the documentary element that was introduced into Tom Jones by this decision, that the camera technique could be very modern. So you had handheld stuff, you had improvised stuff, you had all kinds of things, uh, techniques imported basically from documentary, as well as the fact of making it uh, entirely on location, because Tom Jones again is a film made entirely on location, which was one of the things that Ozzy Morris uh, was reluctant to do, because of the, I mean, color film at that time was uh, uh, 50 AFA, so you needed quite a lot of light, and uh, that made things, could <coughs> make things quite difficult in, in smaller locations, but we made it, we managed it. And the, the, the hunt meat, which is the first clip you'll see, was the, the idea there was that it would be staged as an event and it would be covered by three handheld cameras acting as though they were newsreel camera people. So they just picked what they wanted out of the, out of the event that was just staged as an event. It wasn't staged for the cameras at all. So all we had to do is keep out of, uh, out of each other's picture and sometimes even that wasn't, it didn't happen. But of course, uh, you have to have a certain amount of cooperation from the sound man because in those days, that was absolutely essential because again, shooting it in that way meant that you could not shoot sin sound. So you had to accept what, what is more important on, in a scene like that, to have the freedom of mobility of three handheld cameras or to have the bits with sin sound. So it was decided that that was more important and the sound man my good friend Peter Hansford went along with it and um, we did it in that way and the sound is again entirely you know immediately afterwards we took we did the thing again and we took a wild track uh, of, of general conversation and all the noises and certain specific bits uh, that he kept an eye on as to what we were shooting so that in the cutting room those sounds were then put on laid on so that's the hunt meat so that's one technique then the hunt itself is a very subtle blend, again, um, between uh, very low uh, camera shots, uh, very low dolly shots photographed from a very low uh, little camera vehicle called a Mini Moog, which was a, a sort of mini pickup truck made by, by Morris, Austin Morris. <coughs> it's the mini, the truck version of the Mini, the pickup truck version of the Mini. And we had one set camera set up in, uh, in the back quite low, over, just looking over the edge, so you were about that height. And the other camera I was handheld, I was crouched in the driver's compartment, on the, on the passenger side, photographing out the passenger side with a handheld camera at the same time. And I think it was me who had the long focus lens and he had the, 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 the tripod shot was actually the, the steadier one because it had the... And that is very obvious in the scene where, where, he, uh, where Albert Finney <coughs> rescues Susanna York when her horse bolts at the end of the hunt. Uh, which we only did once, and it was covered in that way, once with the, I mean, from the truck with the, st the static camera, or the, the, the stand camera on the dolly, on the tripod, on this mini moog was the wider, wider angle. I was crouched in the cab with a 75 millimeter lens doing the, because it doesn't matter, it, it all shakes, that, that helps it. And sometimes when we're doing that kind of stuff, uh, you actually add some shaping. There's, there's quite a trick to, 
I mean, handheld camera work is is uh, is a technique uh, quite quite difficult to to perfect, and it has a lot of sides to it. It isn't just a question of holding the camera steady or as steady as possible at all. It's it's there's much more to that, and sometimes one deliberately makes it unsteady. But it's very important the way that you make it unsteady. The the best illustration I can give a, give on that is Zorba the Greek, which we haven't got here today. Um, there are two ship sequences on that during a storm. The first one, which is the most effective one, the sea was actually dead calm, and all the apparent movement of the sea is me on the handheld camera. The second sequence, the sea, the sea was quite rough. The camera had to be tied down as a dialogue sequence. Anthony Quinn was sitting down, Alan Bates was sitting down, clutching the rail outside, and he said, look, there's a dolphin. And all that, all that was done with a, a camera tied to the, to the boat, to the rail, and the, the, the ship, there was quite a lot of pitching, which you don't see because the camera pitches with the boat, so you're not a, 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 as aware of it. But it was so rough that I was one of the few people that was sort of standing up, or at least semi-standing up. The director was very seasick, and he was directing it lying down. <laughs> so it was that rough, but you don't see it. The sequence which looks rougher is the first sequence in the saloon of the boat where the roughness of the sea is all done with the camera and there I developed a, a specific camera movement which I thought, now what is the characteristic of a boat um, you know, a boat in a heavy sea what, what is the sort of movement it is? and it's quite a complex movement it isn't, it isn't just doing that so what I actually did was this and that is the entire, the entire sequence is filmed like that and it works very well so there's, there's a lot to, to handheld. So the so the hunt is the, the thing that makes the hunt so effective is the fact that just when you think that you're on you're tracking very low uh, along the ground, suddenly it starts leaping over bushes because you've cut to a helicopter shot, which also is quite low, but it's it goes over and then you're back on the, on, the, on the tracking vehicle again and that's intercut with certain stage shots like the, the people on a, on a saddle on, there's an illustration in my book or somewhere else with, the, with uh, Peter Bull riding on a saddle which is actually mounted on the Minimoke together with the camera uh, with the background of people riding on, on horses behind and you can kind of pan from the because that if you have it on the screen too long it's obvious that it's false so you, you start or you finish on somebody riding a horse alongside and you pan to him going like this and then you cut to something else and then you back again to him, pan off again so you, you're not aware that he is actually fixed to the camera as it were so it's, it's a combination of all those things that makes that, that sequence so, so effective you just notice it breaks a number of other rules of continuity um, I was once told by a continuity girl that um, if an action proceeds um, say starts going right to left, then it must continue going right to left and uh, all the way through to the end, otherwise people will think that you've turned back. And this is absolute nonsense, of course, <laughs> because if you say, well, if you have a, a shot in between somebody coming towards the camera or going away from the camera, then you can change direction. And then uh, a sort of classical continuity will, will say, ah, yes, but even in a shot coming towards the camera and going away from the camera, they're also going either slightly right to left or slightly left to right. <laughs> Which again is a lot of... Not, I mean, it's perfectly true, but it doesn't matter. The important thing about rules like that is to know how to break them, because you have to break them all the time. And in that, I mean, that hunt flows beautifully, but it's going right to left, left to right, right to left, back. <laughs> Sometimes cut together, it doesn't matter a damn. Yes? Some of that looked a little bit undercranked, some of it a bit overcranked, and was Peter Bull on the horse for that sort of line? And you know, I don't remember. It's possible that we undercranked that slightly. I don't think any of it is overcranked, but it's possible that we went down to 20 frames or something for some of that stuff. Perfectly possible. Did you see the the spurs shot in the huntsman's horn? Completely different colour quality. <laughs> um, oh, quite, quite interesting because Tom Jones is a very successful film and yes, it still very, pops up on yeah. television. You can get it on video. I mean, when you were making it, did you have any idea that it was going to be something special? No. Or? No. Yeah. And Right. I mean, Tony Tony's very interesting when he's cutting because in all of Tony's films, including Tom Jones, well, all the ones that I made with him, the three that I made with him, 
the the first rough cut was always better than the final cut because he he lost courage he lost he he was absolutely desperate by the time Tom Jones was nearly cut uh, nearly finished in the cutting room he was he was suicidal he really think, thought that nothing worked it didn't hang together it was all all a disaster not only did he not know it was going to be a huge success but he really thought it was going to be a disaster and because of that at the last minute they added certain things like the pixelation in the in the hotel sequence and the inn sequence were you know, pixelated, which is not really necessary. It's it's uh, because he was so afraid that it it doesn't really hold. It, he kept speeding things up, and the whole the first both in Taste of Honey and in Tom Jones. I'm not sure about Loneliness, but Taste of Honey and Tom Jones, the first third of the film uh, was better in the in the original cut because it was longer, but it was better because he, he lost uh, faith in, he, he th thought it wouldn't hold, and he, he took, uh, see, he cut scenes in the middle and intercut two scenes, you know, you see the first scene, then you see the first half of the second scene, then you see the second half of the first scene, things like that, and uh, the, the part played by Diane Cilento and Tom Jones was decimated, which is a pity, because it was all very good, but he cut an awful lot of that out because he didn't think it's, it would work, and and as a result, the, the first third of the film, or the first 20 minutes or so, are quite bitty. Well, when you uh, are making a, a film, do you find, that be because you're looking at the shots over and over again, and you get very, very close to it, that you see it differently from how you see it now, after a number of years? I, um, I mean, now you might see it like, like we're looking at it. It may look more like it does to a normal audience. Well, of course, you never see it like that when you're shooting it, because you're seeing it in bits, aren't you? You're seeing it in, in disconnected, you're seeing it in disconnected bits, and it's sometimes quite difficult to, to make it hang together in your mind. I mean, you have to do that, because uh, one thing that comes to mind, for instance, is uh, that because he changed the editing drastically in the first bit of the film, I had some very carefully crafted <coughs> transitions from day through dusk into night, and he jumbled them up and made it quite difficult to 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 keep that going. So, so sometimes one has to, you know, try and, and and know how it's going to be edited because that can be important for the for things like a day to night transition and other things. But um, generally speaking, um, I think fairly early on in my career, I I think I developed the ability to see things. Uh, non-technically. If I, if I go and see a film in the cinema, I certainly don't look at it, or on television. I don't look at it from a technical point of view, unless some particular thing interests me, or my attention is drawn to something which could be a virtue or a, or a fault. But generally speaking, I, I, I watch the, the story, I watch the action, and I don't watch it as a, as a technician. I think it's a pity if one does. So I'm, I'm, I'm very suspicious of... of uh, certain types of film education which, which want to teach people how things are done. I think they're much better not to know how they're done. And they certainly shouldn't be thinking about it while they're looking at it. <laughs> Any more questions on Tom Jones? From time to time, um, one comes across directors who maybe, or are, very good directors, but really can't grasp the basic photography. How do you deal with those sort of people? What? Sort of, I mean, how, what can't they grasp? But basic concepts, even even something as as as, 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 as formless, basic as, as as framing, for instance. Ah, uh, well, that's quite a complicated question. Um, the more li the more literary <coughs> directors, perhaps. Perhaps, I mean, presumably, you you come across that from both of them. Well, I can only I can only um, talk around the question a little bit. That I mean, uh, basically, uh, you try to avoid working with people with whom you have nothing in common because that can't very well lead to anything. Um, my agent was once phoned by some irate gentleman who was short of a cameraman, and who said, uh, "Can you put a camera, Miss Campbell? Can you put a cameraman on the plane for me by twelve o'clock?" like it was a parcel or something. You know. so, I mean, you have to have a, a relationship with the director. And if you make a film, if you work with the same director more than once, and of course such a re relationship can develop, such I, as I developed with Kathy Yannis and with Richardson and with, uh, with uh, more lately with, with James Ivory. 
although he, he's now working with, with Tony Pierce Roberts. But uh, um, other than that, um, I can only, as an illustration, for instance, I w at the same time as I was, I was uh, in the period I was making Tom Jones, I was also working with Kakianis. The two periods ran concurrently. And with, Ka with Tony, I made three films. With Kakianis, I made six films between 1955 and 1967. And um, the two methods of working couldn't be more different. They were at opposite ends of the scale. Because Kakayanis um, wrote, he wrote most of his scripts himself, um, although they may have, may have been based on some other material, like in the case of, of Zorba, of course it was, but some of the scripts were written by him or with a collaborator. And he, the script of The Girl in Black, for instance, which is a film I started with, with Kakayanis, was written not in scenes but in shots, and shots that worked. So you could read the script and you could see the images in front of you. Now this is very unusual and it's also not desirable unless you happen to be, have the talent to do that. If you can write it in shots and they work and you're writing it as notes to yourself, not as a script writer who's going to then offer it to a director who will feel that his realm is being impinged upon, you know, um, then you can do that. So Kakayanis' filmmaking was really a question of actualizing the image on paper and putting that image onto film. But the image as such was already pre-planned, so the actors in Kakianis' films tended to be sort of slotted into ready-made parts, into ready-made bits. And as he was fortunate enough to have excellent actors, like Irini Papas, for instance, uh, it didn't matter because they didn't feel constrained by that kind of approach. Um, but it was a storyboard way of making a film, although he never drew the pictures, but they did come to, to, uh, to uh, eye. Immediately you read it on the page. For instance, he would write that there was an over-shoulder shot, and then the person in the background moves away, and the person in the foreground turns, and it becomes a close-up of the person in the foreground. Now, it's terribly clear, and you can see it in your mind's eye immediately you read it. So you can work like that if you like. But uh, later, uh, at first, I used to admire that, that way of doing it, and we were very fortunate, uh, uh, Kaka Yannis and I had a very similar way of looking at, at images and um, very similar sort of ideas about composition and so on. So by, uh, he could leave it entirely to me, the detailed execution of ev each image, he could leave entirely to me and still get exactly what he wanted. It was, there was no need to ever discuss it. It was, it was kind of okay from almost from square one. Whereas with Tony Richardson, um, I would say my co collaboration with Tony was much more at arm's length. First of all, because there was an operator involved, which was never involved in the in the films with Kakianis. And secondly, because Tony's way of working was completely different. That the scene was written in uh, script was written in scenes, in master scenes, and was broken down for shooting on the day of shooting, or possibly the day before, but usually on the day of shooting, in collaboration with myself and with the operator very much. So. And he would say to the actors who already knew the scene, of course, he, he would say, show me the scene. And they would play the scene. And then he, he would say, yeah, I like that, I like that. And no, I don't like that, no, no. Uh, well, why don't you, you know, you develop the scene with them. And this eating scene, which we're going to see, uh, was developed by the actors. It was indicated in the script, but no more than that. They made, the actors made that scene what it became a famous, famous scene and it was only just indicated in the script. It wasn't there in its entirety at all. They made that seem what it is. And, uh, but uh, Richards and Tony Richardson worked that way generally, um, that the thing would sort of develop during the, uh, see, uh, during the shooting. And that, of course, left the actors much freer to, to contribute. And actors contributing is a, is a very uh, sore point, because I'm, I'm a believer in in, in a strong director. I think a weak director is a disaster. If the actors get the upper hand, it's a disaster. And uh, I've seen so many instances of that in, in my career, they're too numerous to mention. <coughs> um, but on the other hand, they mustn't be so, they mustn't feel themselves to be so hidebound and so constricted by the, by the, by the preconceived ideas in the director's mind that they, they're like puppets. That's obviously also bad. So we have to find some 
suitable middle way where the director can still impose his vision but leave the actor to um, to do his bit and to make suggestions within reason. Um, does that sort of answer your question? Right. So let's look yeah, at well, the, the we look at the eating scene just for the pleasure of it. Sit down, have a meal during which they are more and more attracted to each other. End of story. The rest is all is all done by the actors. They develop that on the spot. Do you think it has something to do because it was like the start of the sixties and all this kind of you know the swinging sixties and um, kind of, you know sexy sexual things were going on and who knows? And, um, yeah. I suppose I should just mention um, that she, she, yeah, she won an Oscar, didn't you, for um, Silver the Greek? Did that have, yes. a, did that have any a big effect on your life at all? Or? Well, no, I didn't. I didn't really make very good use of it because I I turned down the only offers that I got as a result of that. It's the only time that the mainstream of American or British cinema, for that matter, taken any, took any notice of me at all. And I was offered a film by Otto Preminger called When Bunny Lake Is Missing, and one by Stanley Doan called Either Arabesque or something else. I can never remember one of those two. And I turned both down because I didn't like the scripts. And I made a document, long documentary for the Canadian National Film Board instead, which they couldn't understand and they never asked me again. <laughs> it's rather like the Royal Garden Party. I turned that down once as well and I was never asked again. Apparently you worked with, with Orson Welles? Yes, I worked once Oedipus with Orson Welles on Oedipus the King, nearly twice, but the second film didn't happen. He was, he was quite a character. And he was absolutely, a, you know, he, he could be pretty bloody minded when he off, off screen, but when he was on the camera, he was all there. He played a scene as the blind poet Tiresias in, in Oedipus the King. He played a scene staring into the setting sun for was a three minutes or close to a three minute take, two minute 40 second speech, I think, and during which we slowly zoomed in on him. And he never blinked once. And the sound man said, could we have a rehearsal, please? Because he, you know, he didn't know when he could get closer, because I was zooming, when I was zooming. And Orson Welles said, a rehearsal for sound? We're professionals, let's go. And we went. And out of the corner of my eye, I could see the sound man, the sweat was <laughs> running down. <laughs> 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 But he was absolutely there. There was a scene, <coughs> I don't know if you've seen the film, but it's all staged, it's all shot in the ancient theatre of Dodoni in northern Greece near Yanina. And um, using the whole theatre as the acting area, not just the stage area, but the seats, the seating area as well. And there was a scene where Christopher Plummer walks right across the arena from right, right to left or left to right. And Orson Welles is standing in the middle but this was a, a shot like that on, on uh, Christopher Plummer, and we would have panned past Orson Welles' legs. So I asked him to, to stand there, and he said, don't bother, no, I'm not going to. He said, they'll never miss me. And he's absolutely right. He knew, without asking, he knew what lens was there. He knew, you know, you could see the shot. You could see, yes, of course he's there, but in a panning shot like that, who's going to notice whether his legs go through frame or not? So he said, and it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, they had long periods of lighting but not operating, which have been bad news for you. Lighting but not operating? Yeah. No, I've been very fortunate that uh, right until the very recent past, I've always had some films where I could operate. The big problem, you see, by op <coughs> operating yourself or not operating yourself is time. I love to operate myself, and apart from all the union problems, uh, which these days are not that drastic, um, it's, it just resolves itself into a question of time. Because if you have eight or ten weeks to make a film, and it's not too complicated, then stand a good chance of being able to operate and doing it, do it, and not feel that you've been put through the mangle at the end of every day. But if you make some of these films on like I've made two television films with Catherine Hepburn in 21 days, which is just like a full feature. I mean, there's no difference in my book. Uh, it's impossible because you feel like being put through the mangle even if you're just lighting. But they used to they used to tell stories of a thing called the ABC movie of the week, 
which was shot in 12 days, and they used one cameraman for the first six and a different cameraman for the second six. And I'm quite sure that at the end of the first six days, the first cameraman was probably carried out on a stretcher. <laughs> which is back to the parcel syndrome again, you see. Right. Okay, well, I thought we'd move on to the next uh, clip, kind of make a bit of a leap here, which is um, Savages, which you say is your favourite film. This is a Merchant Ivory production. And you were saying, actually, that this hasn't actually been shown on British television. No, they turned it down twice. They turned it down, both BBC and ITV turned it down once close to when it was made, and they turned it down again quite recently, which I've never been able to understand. Um, what I want... Uh, Savages is one of my most favourite films, yes. Because it's, it can only be a film. It couldn't, it couldn't be a play, it couldn't be a book, it couldn't be a novel, it couldn't be anything but a film. And the genesis of the film is a house. James Ivory discovered this house and the script was written to fit the house and it was written by two teams, two uh, uh, scriptwriters working independently and even after we started filming scenes kept arriving which some of which were so complicated that I just you know I thought oh my god are we ever going to do this and some of it we couldn't incorporate but uh, it's, a, it's a highly highly original film and I urge you to try and see it, it's available on video. Um, because it, it really is a, a the, the the absolute opposite of a package. It's a real movie, which can only be it could only be a movie. <coughs> and uh, what I want to show you is that the the opening of the film. It's a film which starts in black and white, goes into into sepia, and ends in color. The 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 biggest part of the film is in color. But I'm going to show you the opening uh, because it was my suggestion to open this way. Uh, one of contributions that cameraman can make is to suggest stylistic things like that. So uh, here we are apparently in the jungle somewhere. Actually we're in a wood in New England and in black and white you can get away with that. You, can, you don't realize that the plants are not tropical at all. You just get away with it. And I, I used a, uh, the last remnants of a Kodak film called Panatomic X which is very, very fine grain which doesn't exist anymore in order to get the best detail, which of course you won't see in this video version, out of the leaves, uh, the leaf, uh, the leafage and the scenery generally. And then at a certain point the film goes into, into sepia, which you'll see. And then the story of the film is, is sort of, is sort of ar ar allegorical, but not with a capital A. Um, it's the story of, of civilization in 24 hours. Here it starts with the savages, and they discover the house, and the, the means of discovering the house is a croquet ball which arrives, which is, by the way, shot, the croquet ball is, by the way, shot <coughs> subsequently in Burnham Beaches near Pinewood. <coughs> um, a croquet ball arrives, and it draws the, the chief priestess towards this house. She feels herself drawn, and they discover the house, and the house is complete with all the props from the 1920s. Everything you see in the film was actually in that house. So you could use all the props, already made, a gift to, to, to a filmmaker clever enough to be able to use it. And then, the, um, and then gradually they become very civilized and they take the masks off and, and uh, they, they, they reach a sort of high point where they're giving dinner parties and uh, having very esoteric conversations and then it all goes wrong and civilization kind of breaks up and they, they via a very... Um, crazy wild croquet, croquet match at the end, they go back, they all run back to the jungle separately, one by one, and it, it ends as it were, full circle the way it began. Anyway, i just show you the, the opening, the, the jungle bit, and a little bit of the jungle bit, and the discovery of the house. Not a word spoken <laughs> during that entire scene. It gets better too. Anyway, I advise you to see the film when, as soon as you can. Do you like the title inserted? Not really, no. no, no. I wasn't mad about the German voice either, because I could understand what they were saying. But it's meant to be not understandable. But, um, well, no, not, not really. Yeah, but no, the, the inserted titles I think are okay. The, the German voice I wasn't mad about, no. It, it recurs several times during the film. But uh, that's just a small point compared to the beauties of it. I mean, when you kind of approached to do that, I mean, did somebody tell you about it or was it written on paper? I mean, how did no. that kind of, you know, how did they get that across to you? That's what, what? I wanted to... Um, 
like the what, how do they get word across to me? He kind of, I mean, as you say, it's a, a kind of a visual piece where no, nobody talks, there's no script as such, so how do they kind well, of... Well, there was a script, but uh, it just says, that, you know, the I mean, the sequence is described, the business with the with the, the consort, you know, this idea which exists in sociology of certain societies, that the, the consort is, is has a final coupling with the with the queen and then he's killed. But the croquet ball saves him. <laughs> that was enough for you to get me kind of interested in it? Yeah. Oh, uh, no, I just did it because I'd, I'd just met uh, James and his and and we'd made a small sort of semi-documentary in England before. That was my first major film with them. And uh, there wasn't, there was, the script certainly wasn't uh, any, uh, I think there was a script when we started, not, not we knew we started in the mud with the mud people. I mean, there was an outline, but there wasn't a, a full script. No. I mean, when pe- people approach you for work, I mean, is it kind of well? In that case, it was simply due to I was only too keen to work with, with those two because they were quite exceptional, and as the body of work since that time has proved, uh, real movie makers. You know, it's quite unique in the history of cinema. I think that a producer director team like that should be together for. 25 years or more now, and and produce such an enormous, extraordinary body of work. I mean, not not every film is perfect by any means, but it's a, it's, as a body of work, it's quite unique. Was that profitable for them? That film? No. <coughs> no, it was it was mishandled, and uh, I mean, there were terrible, terrible problems during the making of it, and <laughs> uh, too long to go into tonight. But uh, no, it was it was no. It, as I say, it was never properly released. It was had a very poor release in the States and, and a very, I can't even remember if, if it was released in England but they could never sell it to television which has always amazed me Why do you think that is? I have no idea, I really have no idea the, the two people, I mean for years it was, it was a monopoly, a duopoly situation that there was one person at the BBC and one person at ITV before the existence of Channel 4 who were responsible for buying in movies and if those two people didn't like the movie that's it and that happened with that film but not once but twice it happened again quite recently well relatively recently uh, when the, I think it was the BBC turned it down again what's the running time the screen time of the film? it's perfectly normal so 86 minutes something like that we've not been better to approach Channel 4 well now, yes. I mean, but uh, I think I think they've all been approached at one point or another, and and uh, nobody nobody wanted it, which is a complete mystery to me. Always has been. And they don't give a reason. They're not obliged. To no, no, they don't. They're not obliged. Not only are not they obliged to, but they just don't. No. Just don't. No. <laughs> anyway, it's available, and I urge you to see it. <laughs> we'll so we better move on fairly yeah. rapidly to heat and dust, which yeah. is the last one which um, I've chosen to show you the dinner party because every Merchant Ivory film, as you probably noticed, has to have a dinner party in it. Savages also has a dinner party in it. <laughs> and this is the dinner party with the lead up to it from, from Merchant Ivory, from Eden Dust, um, which is an example of what you can do under extremely difficult circumstances in a, in a relatively small room. Um, to squeeze all those people in there, and the camera, and the tracks, and the lights, <laughs> it's quite an, it's quite an achievement in itself, and it also includes a, a very nice scene in the courtyard, which uh, uh, illustrates my views about not day for night scenes, but night scenes in general, where all too often the idea is that if you mark anything night, that the first thing the lab does is print it blue. So there's almost an idea around that uh, and night scenes have to be blue. So I hate blue night scenes, and that's about as blue as I like them to get. That one in the courtyard, which is just right to my mind. Well, that's the first one where the video has bothered me because it's you know it's a travesty of, of the quality of the original film. It doesn't with Tom Jones, which was harder anyway. Um, softening on through the video doesn't seem to matter so much, but this is really not a very good version. And if you think there's something wrong with the composition, you're quite right, because it's framed for 166. And when they made the video, they uh, chose to top and bottom it, top and tail it, made, made to cut the sides off, in, in fact. 
which is something that happens these days you can usually if you get there at the right moment you can you can choose to have it shown the way you like letterboxing or not but uh, that video uh, that when that was screened um, that was not the case we weren't consulted and that's how it ended up but um, by that time of course between the time of Tom Jones and this film is exactly 20 years difference it's made in 82 uh, colour stock and colour photography improved enormously and the, uh, the, the film version has a, a subtlety that is, co is completely lost in, in the video so something you need to see properly any Last chance. <laughs> could, could you say something about your experiences of shooting the wild party with James Horrendous. <laughs> Sum it up in one word. Huh? Is it just a, a bad experience? Oh no, not at all. I'm very fond of that film and unfortunately the, the video of it has disappeared from my collection and I can't imagine, I don't know how that happened. I said lent it to somebody and they walked off with it because I can't get another one because that is a film which is, exists in two versions and the commercial version is, is not the right one, the one that's available in video because it was recut, it was taken away from James, recut and, and uh, issued in a, in a truncated and mixed up form. It was, it was never shown in the, in the original version? No, except, no, except it was shown uh, by the BBC in the original form. And it was shown, uh, no, it didn't run in the cinema, no. I think there was a, a re retrospective at some point, a festival or something where it was shown. It, it does exist, the, at least it exists. But, uh, no, the, the Wild Party was, um, well, it was horrendous because it was, it was made in, in, in five weeks. It was made in something like 30 days or 36 days, possibly. And it was immensely complicated, and uh, and Rucker Welsh, you know, kicked up all that fuss halfway through, more than, less than halfway through. First, the first week, I think, or the first ten days were okay, and after that, she became impossible. Which is a shame because she fitted the part very well; she could do it very well. It was, a, it was an interesting story. Wasn't it? Yes, it's a very, it's it's a very nice movie. I think the Wild Party, very nice movie indeed. In its in its original version, but it was immensely difficult to do in in, in the time, with the really fairly minimal equipment we had, and we really struggled. I just wondered why you didn't continue your association with Merchant Ivory. And oh, I did. I'm I'm on the board. <laughs> I'm a member of the board of directors of Merchant Ivory. Um. No, I, I, after, the, after the Bostonians, um, James felt that he needed a, a new influence, he needed a, a different stimulus, which is, which is fair enough. And he started working with, with Tony Pierce Roberts and he's made, very happily made uh, five films with him now. Um, but I went on working for Merchant Ivory uh, with other directors. I made another three films for Merchant Ivory two in India and one in America, and uh, may very well do others. In fact, at the moment I'm developing a subject that I want to direct, which I'm doing with, with, with them. Okay, now I'll just, I'll just finish with one question then, because at the beginning I read that uh, little quote about you at 15, absolutely knowing that you yeah. want to be a cameraman. So can you just tell us why it was that you were so sort of keen and what's kept you going all this time? I don't know why it was that I was so keen, because the next sentence you didn't read out, <laughs> which, which said that I was, you know, at 15 I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my life, and it was a long time before I discovered that everybody else wasn't like that. I really thought everybody knew what they wanted to do. I mean, of course they knew, how could they not know? I just felt like that about it, you know, something was so definite and so positive, and thank God it was, because all the trauma that you have in getting there, uh, if you haven't got tremendous push, <coughs> and determination, then uh, you'll fall along the wayside somewhere, which is what I'm always saying to to, to the students, to the camp students who are studying camera. But um, these days, I, I'm not sure if I would want to take up this job because the sad fact of the matter is that, at least in England, 
uh, if you want to be a cameraman, a camera person, um, <coughs> you have to be prepared to spend, say, five or even ten years of your life making a living on commercials and any, any bit of drama photography that comes your way to regard that as a bonus. You cannot count on making a living at photographing drama in this country. There just isn't enough around. And all the people that, that come out of film school, and uh, I have a, my erstwhile assistant, Stuart Harris, has become one of the best uh, for, uh, commercial cameramen. He's tremendously in demand. And he's, he's photographed just one feature film in, in all the time that he's been a cameraman, called Weatherby. Um, <coughs> a, he isn't offered them, and even if he is offered them, he can't afford to take them. Because the money isn't there, and... and uh, but even to get there, one or two of, the, of my students at the National Film School, for instance, National Film Television School, have been lucky enough to get in. But it's a very tricky business, you know. Those who have been lucky enough to come straight out of film school and get a job photographing drama of some of some kind, um, always remind me of the phrase of my dear friend John Fletcher, who died some time ago. He used to say, um, "They think they're in. They think they're in on the ground floor, but we're going to pull the ground right from under their floor." And that's the position that they're in. That, that just because you've got a start doesn't mean to say it's going to continue. One of, one, of the, one of these days, months, weeks, or years, you wake up and you find, you think, oh, that's strange, the phone hasn't rung lately. It's, it's, a, very, it's a very different world to, to the, one, the one that I came into. You know, I was determined to, to make feature films, to photograph feature films. I knew I could do it. I thought I knew I could do it. And there were plenty of uh, chances to make feature films. I mean, I, it took me quite a while to get in. And I went a very devious path to get in, a very circuitous path to get in. And again, when I was in, I wasn't really in, because after 10 months of being a clapper boy in Loda at Riverside Studios, the entire studio group went broke. And we were all thrown out of work. But I, then I started working as focus puller on documentaries and gradually got back into features again. I, I kept going. But there were lots of periods when, um, you know, there wasn't, <laughs> wasn't that much work around. So uh, it's, a, it's a very different story, but it is rather sad that uh, that all that talent goes on on photographing commercials, and they have to they have to do that whether they like it or not, because that's where the money is. Okay, so that kind of brings our evening to conclusions. It's nearly ten o'clock. I think we're going to get thrown out, but I'd like to thank Walter Leffley very much for coming tonight. Pleasure.